Would you like me to start off the way I did last oh, time? Yes, and just, uh, but, but not, it wouldn't be quite as long. Well, that's... Uh, that's what a, I mean is, you know, because we have other things for the, the class. Well, that's no excuse. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. So, uh, anyway, go ahead. All right. Uh, I was just talking to Jeff about how I uh, began my approach to, to art. And uh, when I go to high schools and middle schools, I talk to kids about art and creativity and uh, where it all begins uh, and how they should look at things in uh, a different sort of way in the world. And uh, when I look back, I think the images that mean the most to me are the most intense are the ones that I experienced when I was very young. And uh, for me, it was living on an air base in Panama uh, while my dad was the uh, air base commander. And uh, seeing the images uh, that were there on the base, like iguanas and large volcanic rocks. And uh, there are certain moments when you see things that are beyond nor the normal thing. It's just different. Uh, like being on a, a beach one day with my father and, and mother, and mom had walked down the beach and dad and I were sitting and he said all of a sudden, get on top of this rock. And I, I got on top of it. It was about as big as the table that you see there. And in the brush behind, we heard this rustling, and out came hundreds of thousands of little orange-red crabs. And they were just, they covered the beach orange-red and parted around the rock that we were on, giving us their little crab-like. Crab I don't know what kind they were, but they just gave us the usual crab, little crab bad look. You know, <laughs> yeah. sour sort of looking, looking, you know, as they're walking past. You know, like, you stay away from me, and uh, made their way to the uh, ocean because somebody had punched a time clock and it was time to go back in again. And there they went. And I was only about two and a half years old, but I knew that that was something different than normal. You're not going to see something like that every day. And to this day, it remains one of my most intense uh, images. So I tell kids to remember things that you see that are interesting. Uh, don't always just Keep your nose to the to the ground. Look around you and uh, remember the images. And this is what touches on what has come to be my take on surrealism in art: that it's not so much a thing as it is an idea. The way we look at the world, and uh, by definition, uh, surrealism is the depiction of the artist's psyche on canvas. Uh, and I think that that's, that's true, it's a very basic definition, but it's the way we see ourselves and the, and the way we see our uh, environment and uh, the projections that we have for things that are different in the world. Um, I have dreams occasionally of the paintings that were completely finished and uh, they never end up the same way if you start painting them, but uh, they come from that same sort of uh, approach that you try to uh, see the world and the different things that go on it, like looking at clouds and seeing that clouds change, or looking at finding patterns in trees, and uh, anything that you can see that makes the world a different sort of place, because it is, uh, there's a lot more going on than we allow ourselves to, uh, to think. And that's what gives us, a, gives us a heightened sense. I call it a moment of uncommon perception when we see the world in a different way. And uh, it can happen every day and in different ways. It, sometimes it could be the uh, shining of light on top of a rock that looks different than you've ever seen before, uh, but it produces that, uh, that sort of feeling that this is something that's different and you want to kind of record it or get it down. And I spent uh, about eight years painting Oregon landscapes simply because it, uh, it was good practice. It opened up my palette and it was, uh, you know, people like landscapes and they, they can sell. So there's a uh, a very practical factor there, uh, but I always went back to the uh, more surrealistic approach, things that I created from my own mind. And uh, I found that the uh, painting of landscapes helped because uh, since it did open up my color palette and everything, I, I applied it to the way I was working with my own ideas and, and the, the way I thought when I worked on the canvas. So that's pretty much where I, I am right now. I'm uh, getting back to some of the larger paintings, as you can see from this one, it's 48 by 60. I had taken, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I, I collect hundreds and hundreds of photographs. Generally, I don't use them. I, I look at them. 
but you put them through your brain and you have a mental file cabinet. So when you're looking at something on the canvas and you say, I need to put something there that looks like it works, you could go filing through your, your brain for the image. And the way it comes out will not be the photograph itself, but your interpretation of it. And you synthesize that material and make it work uh, with your painting. So I've used that uh, any, approach any number of times. And I keep, sta I have stacks of photographs that I never look at. But I did look at them once or twice. <laughs> and the memory of them is in my, in my brain. So I pull them out. And since I think somewhat photographically, it's kind of like producing your own photograph on an idea. And uh, I had the same thing happen with this fellow over here, which depicts uh, the Celilo Falls uh, event when the, that was called the last day uh, before the place was flooded, or the Bonneville Dam. And uh, took that fellow and put him in a different position. And uh, having been in the area where the falls are coming down, uh, still, in certain areas, I was able to uh, take that and uh, reproduce that on the canvas. But every painting is uh, an opportunity for exploration. I don't go with any set idea because I learn too much when I'm working on it. And uh, I find that if you're not paying attention to what's happening on the canvas, then you're not really painting. You're fighting against yourself. And uh, that allows me to uh, educate myself as I go. Each painting is a new experience. And uh, that's the way I, I try to, it keeps it fresh. Since uh, I don't have any pre-planning that I, that I stay with, it allows for pleasant occurrences to happen on a canvas. If you see something that, uh... what about that one, Cindy? That's a, that, well, that was uh, one of what we call uh, palette paintings, or I call them palette paintings. And uh, for a lot of years, I was painting with these paper palettes, and they were they were wax infused, and you have to throw them away after you're done. And I found that I was wasting a lot of paint on those palettes, but I was liking what I was seeing beginning to happen on them. So I thought, well, how do I make use of this? And I decided to cut some 11 by 14 boards, gesso them, sand them down, uh, mix my paints on them. And when I liked what I was seeing, turn it into a painting. And I've created some of my happiest uh, pieces doing that. Uh, they're all, most of them are about 11 by 14. Some are a little bit larger. But uh, when you're mixing your paints and you're working on a canvas, sometimes you find you're, you're, you like what you see on the, uh, uh, the mixing palette uh, better than what you're working on on the canvas. So I've, I've turned away from the canvas on occasion to work on palette paintings, and I have a whole series of those. And uh, I do it to this day. I have stacks of them all waiting, waiting to go. So I can always have something, you know, to, uh, to work on. I will always have something to paint. That's, I, I don't understand uh, an artist who says, well, I, I really don't know what to paint right now. And, and I said, my gosh, how can that possibly be? <laughs> I, in 20 lifetimes, I would never be able to get to a quarter of the things that I've had ideas for. I have stacks of ideas uh, that I've written down. I call it visual shorthand. Uh, you know, I can look at it and see the movement of a, a pen or a pencil and recall what I was thinking when I saw that. And I keep hundreds and hundreds of those things. And I, occasionally, I even use them. Sometimes they turn out to be decent little drawings. You know, and so uh, you always keep stuff like that. That's part of what they call the ephemera <laughs> of, uh, of the art. So, yeah, I, I keep lots of ideas, and uh, I, I hope to be able to get to a smattering of what I've thought about doing. So you're constantly having to shuffle through the deck, and pick out which one, if I were to pass on tomorrow, which painting will I have to have had finished. It's so kind of an uncommon in the back of your mind, it's kind of a constant process. Which one do I have to be working on now? How old were you when you first started to paint? I was actually about two and a half years old. Um, my dad was, uh, as I said, the base commander of the Cadell Zone, and he and Mom were very creative people. My dad had been in the Air Force for 26 years, uh, planned the airborne invasion of Normandy and Holland. Uh, he was 
big in the Air Force, and uh, but he was also at one time a, an English major at Columbia University, and one of his teachers and friends, I don't know if he was a teacher at the time, was Thornton Wilder, who wrote Our Town and the Bridge of San Luis Rey. And uh, during World War II, Wilder was involved in Air Force Intelligence while my dad was in the Army Air Corps, and they used to go down into Algiers in North Africa, and he'd talk Wilder about art and, and literature and this sort of thing and he asked uh, Wilder one time what young writers he should be looking to read and Wilder thought for a moment and he said I see a lot of young people who want to become writers but very few who want to write and my dad thought that that was important so he told me that and uh, later on and the gist of the thing is you're going to be about something or you're going to be something and to be you have to do um, a lot of people, they might like the idea of living the life or uh, uh, being around people who are creative or doing whatever, but they don't actually engage in it. And I noticed this a lot in college. There were people that liked to hang around around the art department and they, they didn't really produce anything. Uh, just as there were a bunch that seemed to hang around the anthropology department, but they didn't really do anything there either. Um, so it's a matter of active engagement, and uh, otherwise you're always on the outside looking in. Yeah. And, uh, and I showed you that one. Uh, let's see, here's one that's kind of in progress, but I brought it anyway because it shows a little bit of my uh, interest in archaeology and uh, different uh, landforms of the world, so I create my oh, own wow. spaces. <laughs> Uh, Look at those. There's some very interesting There's places bunnies. in the world where, <laughs> well, there's stone-like uh, sculptures that some, yeah. somebody might have put there. Uh, wow. Who knows? It's not a real place, but oh, then no. maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, like to <laughs> think, I like to think sometimes that I tap into places that exist somewhere. <clears throat> maybe we do. It's, uh, our, our dream world has more to do with reality than we, than we know. And uh, for the smaller paintings, well, let's see. This is one of the Oregon paintings. This is uh, from down in uh, near French Glen. One of the houses, uh, an old homestead down near Fields, actually. It's the population is seven. It's, a very, it's not a very populated area there. Uh, Cindy knows about that area. That's where you find arrowheads. Well. Yeah, that's right. Interesting uh, landscape and uh, not many people. A lot of silence except for the wind and an occasional bird which is fine by me. <laughs> now, this is, one that, this is a palette painting. It's one that I, I want to do a little more work on. I can see a couple of things that need touching up. Uh, but the basic concept was uh, kind of fun. In fact, Roger Hull has the drawing uh, to this uh, painting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, is that in their stacks? In what? I, I don't know where he has it. Oh, oh is it his himself? It's his, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And we have Mount Jefferson. A little thing that I had that I was working with called on, on stones. Uh, I have a different series called Working Stones, Standing Stones. Uh, people do a lot of, have done a lot of work with stones at a cultural level uh, over thousands of it's years. like an Indian grinding. Yeah, something grinding. like that. Have fun with that. And, uh, Can I see Mount Hood? Mount Hood? She wants to see it. Oh, yeah, this is... Uh, yeah, there we I'm go. Jefferson, I mean. oh, I think that's Jefferson. Yeah, it's Jefferson. Yeah, I had some... Every once in a while, these landscapes come out kind of the way you like, and this was one that I liked. Uh, there was something moving around in it. Um, and it's the way you use your brush. <coughs> Uh, the way I, I paint well, a lot with my surreal work, uh, in, in a sense, is kind of referring to uh, people like John Singer Sargent, who really knew how to make the brushwork look like the object he was painting. Uh, so if you see the movement of a wave, the movement of your hand holding the brush produces that wave. I saw a painting of his in Los Angeles where I went into a room and it looked like it was a painting of his grandmother at the other end of the room. And she was wearing what looked like an, an earring on one side, the other was obscured, and I couldn't see it as well. But as I got closer, I realized that it was an earring that he painted. 
and uh, closer, and I realized that it was a crystal earring. I got it right onto the thing, and not only found that it was a crystal earring, but found that he had painted it with one brush stroke, which means that he had mixed his opaque paint you know, with his medium to the de just the degree he needed to leave a little bit of color here and a little bit of translucence there, and it twisted the brush to get that form of the crystal earring. One brush stroke. That told me that it was some, somebody who was a master of his materials. And it's one thing that I, I, I guess I do kind of preach it, because you have to know the tools that you're using. And I don't think people are learning as much about that now as they used to. It may be coming back, I hope so. But uh, I think we've, uh, at least in this country, lived the, uh, the story of the emperor's new clothes for a long time. And uh, trying to see something there that really isn't there. <coughs> That's where critics come in. That's how they <laughs> make their living off of <laughs> art. They're talking about something that isn't there necessarily. Um, but uh, I think you have to know the materials. As an abstraction, Picasso was uh, a master of anything he wanted to do. He could paint like Michelangelo when he was 14. So he has the right to take a bicycle seat and turn it upside down and put handlebars on it and show it as a bull's head. <laughs> That's a, you know, he knew the whole spectrum of how to produce art. Now, this is a little one uh, from the head of Indian Gorge near uh, Steens Mountain, which is in the area where that, that house, uh, old homestead painting was. And this is a palette painting, actually. I started out mixing my colors, and all of a sudden I started seeing some colors that I re re remembered from my trip to Steens Mountain, and it became Indian Gorge uh, from an actual photograph that I'd had of Indian Gorge, but I'd already put in most of the colors, so it turned out to be something unique. And a lot of the colors that you see there are places where I was just mixing my paint, and it turned out in the right way. That's one that Sidney's seen last time. This is another palette painting, just one I created. Kind of a mountain-like escarpment and the plain in the distance. So I, I, one of the reasons I discovered, or how I discovered some of the principles of, of art, like composition, perspective, and the like, I learned it at an early age, living in Panama. When my dad would take off in his uh, C-47, I'd be there with my mom on the runway watching him take off, and you know, to a child, the runway looks like it's going to go on forever. And you have, right in front of you, the fundamentals of perspective, time, distance, uh, and uh, geometry, all there. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I, I knew later what I was looking at. It had affected some of the ways, uh, some of the things that I paint. I adapted uh, that imagery monumentality. There were huge volcanic rocks around our, our house. I knew that they were big, but mon monumentality is a concept. Uh, we can make a tiny painting like that that shows monumentality in it, or a very large painting that shows an idea that's actually rather small, uh, it being a concept rather than a thing. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs>